I want to invite you to go there to the book of Exodus, to the Ten Commandments in chapter 20. And I think everyone who knows the Ten Commandments knows where it is in the Bible, which is Exodus 20. And there in the first three verses, this is the first command that God gives. Um, he says in verse 1, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. And he goes on to say, you shall make to yourself no graven image, nor shall you bow down to them, nor serve them. So as we look at what the Bible says about idolatry, idolatry actually affects our relationship with God. And that is what God is dealing with in Exodus 20. It's very important to see that because the first half of the commandments deal with our relationship with God. The second half deal with our relationship with each other. And so it's important and simple, and yet it is crucial for us to understand how God wants us to live. In Exodus 34, verses 12 to 16, this is what it says. Take heed to yourselves, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you're going, lest there be a snare in your midst. But you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down the wooden images. For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods, and make sacrifice to their gods. And one of them invites you, and you eat of his sacrifice, and you take of his daughters for your sons. And his daughters play the harlot with their gods, and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. You shall make no molded gods for yourselves. What is... God communicating through Moses simply this, that idolatry affects the culture. Idolatry infiltrates relationships, and it begins with the relationship with God. So as we consider these statements, we must consider the fact that we live in an age of unbelief and extreme skepticism. Everything is questioned and assaulted with the relative weapons of postmodernism. The average American is a self-reliant, opinion-driven individual filled with often contradictory concepts of reality. Opinions are very unstable criteria on which to rely for security in life. An opinion is rooted in interest. An opinion might even be driven by curiosity more than real concern and certainly has nothing to do with convictions. An opinion can change from one day to the other. But beliefs are convictions and convictions are rooted in the conscience and do not change by the latest interests. So regardless of our claims and beliefs, all humans by nature worship something. Whether a god, whether a concept, an idea, a philosophy, another human being, or things, or ideals, we all worship something, and we worship that which we live for. And so long after the ancient revelation of the great commandment against idolatry, the human race continues to traffic in the evil of idolatry in one form or another. First of all, let's look at the act of idolatry. I'll give you a definition. According to most uh, scholars, an idol is any material or immaterial object that represents the concept of deity or God. It usually takes some physical form which attracts the awe or reverence of an individual toward it. 
Idolatry includes attributing characteristics, traits, and religious or supernatural value to an object or concept that belong only to God. Human beings have an inherent proclivity to worship visible and tangible objects. It satisfies an internal need to experience a mystical intimacy with something beyond themselves. It provides a sense of personal security. The problem with idols is that they present a distorted and misconceived ideation of God and his person. You recall Jesus said in John 4.24, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God then is intangible in a three-dimensional universe because of his supernatural and eternal nature. He cannot be comprehended by human reason or imagination. The absurdity of idolatry, they attempt to render an eternal being into a temporal physical relic. There are many words that the ancient Hebrew text uses to describe idols. But I want to refer you here to Isaiah chapter 44, verse 9, and going on to 20. It says, those who make an image, all of them are useless, and their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They neither see nor know that they may be ashamed, who would form a god or mold an image that profits him nothing. Surely all his companions will be ashamed. And the workmen, they are mere men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up, yet they shall fear. They shall be ashamed together. The blacksmith with the tongs works one in the coals, fashions it with hammers, and works it with the strength of his arms. Even so, he is hungry, and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. So you see, idolatry usually had to do with the economy. Idolatry had to do with livelihood. And most of them believed that if they worshiped a particular idol, they would be prospered in a particular area. And the, the prophet says, they're finding out by experience it is not so. And so they're just as useless as their idols because the idolatry is absolutely worthless. And so it is nothing that you can live by in this world. It provides a non sequitur, as they call it, a non-reality. In verse 13, he says, the craftsman stretches out his rule. He marks out with chalk. He fashions it with plain. He marks it out with the compass and makes it like the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. He cuts down the cedars for himself. He's showing the detail and the labor that's put into all of this. And he says, and he takes down the cypress and the oak, special wood. He secures it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a pine, and the rain nourishes it. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it and bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. With this half he eats meat. He roasts the roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, ah, me. Uh, he says, ah, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the rest of it, he makes into a god. His carved image, he falls down before it and worships it, prays to it and says, deliver me for you are my god. They do not know nor understand. For he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see and their hearts so that they cannot understand. And no one considers in his heart, nor is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned half of it in the fire, and shall also bake bread on its coals. 
I have roasted meat and eaten it. And shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside. And he cannot deliver his soul nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? So you see, one of the curses of idolatry is that it darkens the understanding. It blinds the perception. And the individual cannot see the foolishness of his practice. If you go to Jeremiah 10, the first few verses refers to the same thing, cutting down the tree, putting the silver on it, making it beautiful, and then worshiping it, saying, this is my God, and so forth. But God displays the absurdity of it using the language of sarcasm, a biblical sarcasm that demonstrates the utter foolish and uselessness of what idolatry was and is. The Bible uses several words for idols. The Bible uses several words for idols. All of them imply symbols of power, symbols of beauty and attractiveness. And when God speaks of them, he speaks of them in derision. And the words imply that their vanity and their grievous and they're weak and they're cursed and they're worthless and empty, they're unclean. He even refers to them in the term that means dung or human manure. He considers us complete trash. In the books of Kings and Ezekiel, he uses the word often, gilalam, which means an object that is rolled, implying that it has no capacity whatsoever and is completely helpless. It has to be carried along. And so, as we look at it, then we consider the nature of idolatry. Idolatry, then, is the act of engaging or experiencing an intimate adherence to an object of adoration which tends to possess the convictions of the human conscience. An idol is anything that becomes a fixed object of worship and servitude. It includes the complete allegiance and devotion of the individual to that object. By its very nature, the object affects the human will, the reasoning powers, the intentions, and the devotions. And when it does that, it, number one, represents God. Number two, it replaces God. Number three, it might even remove God. And number four, it at least obscures God. And so an idol has the power to distort the true concept of God and seduce the human heart to an unyielding loyalty to a complete counterfeit. I refer you to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 to 8, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 14 to 21. Read those when you get a chance, and you'll see what the apostle says about it. As we consider also the struggle with idolatry, we realize that idolatry has never ended. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 18, the old saint says, We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. You see, today's idols take many cultural forms. They invade the human imagination with non-realities and cultural illusions. And they are rooted in personal passions. You know, one of the famous historians, Paul Johnson, said once that uh, history has so much to teach us if we will only, only learn, he says, 
He says, but we're too rooted and enslaved to our passions and our prejudices that we cannot see. America is plagued with multiple forms of idols. We even refer to entertainers as idols. And there's a television program watched worldwide called American Idol. We even see it as something wonderful. Modern idolatry includes the idolization of property, of finances, of prestige and fame, other persons. How many people commit suicides for wives, for husbands, for girlfriends, for boyfriends? It's total idolatry. We used to sacrifice in the ancient times people to the pagan idol. Now we sacrifice people to people. We sacrifice people to an idea, to a political regime. We live in times of disease, obsession. We now even have laws because of that that are called laws against stalking, the obsessive focus on another. Religious ideas can become idols. Religious practices and traditions can become idols, even if they have nothing to do with biblical Christianity. And then we have the idolization of a godless government. You know, people really think the government's going to save them. How blind can you be? That's what happens when you compromise with an idol. You see, the idol comes in, it tracks the mind, and it poisons the mind into thinking that it needs the idol. But see, idols, the minute you start realizing they're idols, they change the rules. So you can keep seeing them as idols. Nations rise and fall according to their idols, and most end in disaster. The victory is knowing God and loving God. Matthew 22, 37, Jesus says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. What does it mean? Your heart is what holds your convictions, what you believe in, what you're willing to die for. Your soul has to do with your aspirations, what moves you, what drives you in this world. And your mind has to do with how do you spend your time? What is it you think about most? Says God wants you to love him in all those areas. The God of the Bible then has revealed himself as a God of love. He's transcendent. He's sovereign. He holds absolute power and control over all creation, both the universe and individuals. Isaiah 55, 5 says, Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. You see, the God of the Bible is imminent. He has involved himself in his creation by direct and written revelation. And though his love and his mercy uh, were not known by the pagan nations, they are now known as he has intervened through his son to rescue the human race from its inevitable tragedy. There is no hope for the earth or the human race except in God. We must not live life without God. We must not leave the earth without God. God. There is no greater illusion than that of idolatry. 
And there's no greater illustration of God's love for the human race than the one portrayed in the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15. It is the diary of a father's undying love. And there's no greater declaration of God's love for the human race than John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 1 John 3 verse 1 Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. God circumvented our inclination toward idolatry by revealing himself in an astonishing manner. He became human. In 1 John chapter 1, he says, That which we have seen, that which we have handled with our hands, which is God, the word of life. In 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is that mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. So God the Son entered the world, which was cursed with endless idolatry. And he revealed himself as the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We see God in the face of Jesus. Jesus declared in John 14, 9, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Interestingly, humanity possesses no relics or physical image of Jesus anywhere. And that's mainly because the Jews did not believe in making painted or carved images of anything or anyone. They considered it idolatry. So generally in our age, the images representing Jesus and the apostles are merely accommodated. They're not intended to be objects of worship. And they're not important because they're sacred, but rather they are visual references to spiritual and divine realities. It poses a serious danger to not know the difference. Idolatry never dies. It merely takes different forms according to nations and culture. Today, idolatry takes a cultural and personal form. It comes in the mesmerization of cultural illusions and personal passions. In Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, Paul says that we were all dead in sins because we followed this kind of culture but he made us alive in Jesus Christ so the Holy Scriptures declare that idolatry will be will always be here that it will be till the end of time the Bible tells us that idolatry will last till the end but it will be very different in the end it would be the idolization of the individual in the end it involves the dethroning of God from the human reason and heart and enthroning the self and its passions to the exclusion of everything else, especially God in the Bible. It is the age wherein human passion is God. Second Timothy 3, verse 1 and on, he says, But know this, that in the last day perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unfaithful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, simply put, gossipers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power from such turn away. What are the idols sin that have invaded your soul and unbalanced your life? Is it money? Is it power? Is it a career? Is it a personal habit? Is it another person? 
the most common, undetected, and dominant idol of today's culture is selfishness. The idol of me, myself, and I. It waves the iron fist that declares mine, 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 me first, me all. Selfishness is the most deceptive and enslaving passion of all passions. It is the idol above idols. As do you long to be rescued from the tyranny and the power of idolatry? Jesus can set you free. Turn to him and he will do that.